in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me Okay, there we go. Good morning, West Haven. How is everyone this morning? We're doing fantastic here. We got lawn chairs and pickup trucks and people in the back of vans. And I'm pretty sure this is somewhere in the New Testament. I'm just not exactly sure where that's at. But we're glad all of you are here. And if you're a guest, if you're a visitor, thank you for coming. Understand this. I can't see a lot of people from this vantage point because we got a row of people all the way back there. And so I can't see you, but hopefully you can see me or at least you can hear me. And if you're a guest, I'd love to meet you afterward. Pastor Nathan would love to meet you afterward. So if you would be so kind as just to take a few minutes to grab us afterward, we'd, we'd enjoy the privilege of uh, talking to you and getting to meet you and, uh, and uh, talking to you a little bit about uh, being here and just thanking you for being here. It's going to be a good morning of worship, and then immediately afterward, we have a breakfast for lunch meal. Who doesn't like eggs and biscuits and gravy? That's what I thought, exactly what I thought. And they're good for you. They're somewhere high up in the food pyramid. I'm not exactly sure where, but I think they're an essential nutrient. So afterward, we want you to stay. The meal is free. It'll be served inside downstairs in the fellowship hall. And so we encourage all of you not just to worship with us, but to stay afterward and fellowship with us. And so the plan for the next few Sundays is as long as the weather cooperates, we're going to have the services outdoors. Now, obviously... It depends on the weather. The goal is to make the call by Thursday night, although this is Kansas, so uh, you want to be sure to pay attention to our website and uh, our tech service because we might, we might have to change on uh, Saturdays. And if we do have to change, we'll go indoors and have two services at 8, 30, and 10. But right now, for the foreseeable future, we'll have a service outdoors at 10. If we have to go inside, it'll be uh, 8, 30, and 10. And during that time, regardless of whether we're indoors or outdoors, we'll have the two adult Bible fellowship classes that will still meet. Those are taught by Blake Waters and Todd Jansen, so uh, just be aware of that. Also, I want you to notice that next Sunday evening is our church-wide prayer meeting. With all that is happening today, I don't think God could be providing more of an incentive for us to come together than to pray and to pray than He is right now. So we want you to... Uh, to put that on your calendar as well, and we hope that you'll be part of that. And then just to let you know that we're going to shoot some drone footage today, so if there's a drone overhead, don't worry. It doesn't have a payload. There's, no, uh, there's, there's nothing bad going on, but uh, you might hear a drone flying overhead, and, uh, and Nathan's going to be shooting some video as well. We want to use this in some, uh, some future, probably a website and maybe some other things. So Thank you so much for being here. We are delighted that you're with us. Right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day together in your word and the fellowship that we enjoy together all across this parking lot. At the start of 2020, we had no idea that we'd be doing this, but you're still so kind that you allow us to gather together and worship you, and we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And your word says that you sent the messenger of Jesus ahead of you, John the Baptist, who would prepare Jesus' way, that he would tell us to prepare the way for the Lord, making his paths straight. And I pray for all of us this morning that we would make our paths straight in the honor of the Lord and in glory, in the glory of the Lord, and in what he has told us to do in, as we follow him in obedience and in truth. And uh, we know that your son was baptized, and when he was baptized, the Spirit descended up on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And so that, that Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, went on to live a sinless life, 
And then he died on the cross for our sins. He died on our cross as a substitute so that by repentance and faith we might have eternal life. And Father, I pray for every person here this morning that the absolute certain testimony of their life is that they are trusting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that eternal life is most certainly theirs because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. We're in a day and age that is, has, has so much turmoil in it. I know that I've not experienced anything like this in my life, and I also know it could be far worse. But I know that you're sounding an alarm, that you are getting our attention. And it behooves all of us to examine ourselves, to repent of our sins, to ensure that our faith and trust is in you, and that we are walking with you in obedience to your truth. And we thank you that you give us the grace and the power to do exactly that, that you would empty us of self-righteousness, that you would fill us with Christ's righteousness, and that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. And through wisdom and knowledge and understanding, we would walk wisely in this evil and perverted generation and that we would shine like light in the darkness and that our witness would be very clear, very pure, and very holy to all those who in your providence you choose to have us come into contact with. We want to be bold and wise witnesses of you and we want to do it with joy and we want to do it with reverence, and yet we want to do it with gentleness. So I pray that in all of our lives you would teach us to be more like Jesus in every way, in every aspect of our life. It's our desire to bow before you in humble adoration and what you work in our lives, that is you sanctify us and you grow us to make us more like your son. I pray that you would do that in each individual life, that you do it in each family, that you would do it in this church, and that you would do it here today. We thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for these faithful saints who have gathered this morning, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Would you stand with us as we prepare to sing and, and hear from the word of the Lord coming from Lamentations chapter 3. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. Let's sing. Come now, fount of every blessing, turn my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loud as praise. Teach me some melodious sounding, sung by flaming tongues above. Raise the mountain, fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. To grace, how great a debtor, daily I come strained to be. Let thy grace flow like a fetter, bring my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy. Oh, that day when free from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face. Oh, the raiding, blood wash linen, how I see thy sovereign race. Till at home with you at last, for I know thy power will keep me till I'm home with you at last. Paul writing.
talking to the church at Corinth. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. We were dead in our sins, but because of grace, through Christ, he makes us alive. Let's sing. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life. Darkness rejoice, there's no heaven in writing to the church at Corinth, what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. 
Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.
with me church heavenly father yes we will remember your great works yes we will remember your ancient wonders we will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions god your way is holy your way is is great throughout redemptive history you revealed your strength you performed miracles to deliver your beloved people the greatest miracle of all being the incarnation life death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, for sinners such as us. And so we thank you for grace, we thank you for mercy, and we thank you for Jesus. And so mighty God, by your strength, by your word, and by your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds this morning that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed by our brother Mike, uh, that we may hear with joy what you say to us today. We pray these things in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, praise team. Just a couple of preliminaries. Number one, I want to thank everyone who's responsible for setting this up every week. Uh, Nathan, the praise team. There are a lot of other people who come out and set these tents up and the sound equipment. It's a lot of work, and I appreciate very much their efforts so we can worship together as one in the Lord. Secondly, I want to thank... Uh, Christian Perez for singing on the praise team this morning, pinch hitting for us. Uh, some of you wonder where my wife is. We have our grandkids this weekend, so she's over here on my right keeping the grandkids corralled. And, uh, you know, grandkids make you feel like a million dollars, those of you who are grandparents, aren't they? 
I may or may not have told my granddaughter this weekend that I was the king and that she was my servant and she had to hold an umbrella over me and feed me grapes and fan me with a palm frond. And if she didn't, I would throw her in the dungeon with the alligators. And the sad truth is I did have to throw her in the dungeon with the alligators, but she said she hid underneath the dead alligator carcass and got out. So kids are pretty, uh, pretty quick on their feet. Uh, number three. If you want to share this feed on Facebook, now that I told that terrible story, you can share this feed on Facebook so other people can hear this sermon. And then number four, I'm going back today to preach out of the Christian Standard Bible. I apologize to a lot of you. We switched to that about a year ago. I know many of you bought that Bible to follow along on a Sunday. And then when the pandemic hit and I started going from 100 to 110 miles an hour, I grabbed the, my old New American Standard version because I was so familiar with that, and then I just never turned back. So Today, we'll be in the Christian Standard Version, and I want to read these verses. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, churches were scarce when Paul wrote this letter. About 40 years later, about 100 A.D., churches became more prevalent. And then about 50 years after that, church buildings began to be built. Services, church services then, were very long. They sung many psalms and hymns. They prayed for God to bless their community, and they read a lot of Scripture. There was at least one sermon, and if a church had more than one pastor, you might hear more than one sermon in one day. Then they prayed for the needs in the church, and then those who had not been baptized were asked to leave, and then they observed the Lord's Supper. After that, if you weren't there, the deacons went to look for you, and they brought the Lord's Supper to you. The church, this whole thing, is Jesus' idea, and in this passage, Paul exhorts this church to obey biblical principles that will strengthen the church, but it takes every member to do exactly that. So let's establish an absolute truth this morning. You are not here by accident. You may think, well, I decided to get up this morning and go to church. No, God brought us all here, and he did it for a reason. Together, he wants us to grow stronger. Multi-generational, multi-ethnic, different backgrounds, but all one in Christ, and we need to grow stronger, and we need to do it quickly. We need to do it quickly because there's a five-alarm fire going on all around us. God is shouting right now. Now, God could use far more harsh ways to get our attention, but make no mistake, God is shouting. C.S. Lewis said pain is a megaphone to get our attention. And logic would dictate that all those who have heard the name of Jesus would recognize that he is shouting. And many would come rushing to churches and in repentance and prayer and faith, not only get right with God, but seek him with a newfound fervency. Yet amazingly, since COVID has hit, the statistics are unmistakable. Many are falling away from the Lord. That makes no sense. Now, I'm hopeful, mainly because I believe God is going to continue to apply pressure, and positive circumstances tend to lull us to sleep, while negative circumstances tend to awaken us spiritually. So all of us, we have to consider this, all of us, if we hope that the lost world will be alarmed by the events of today and repent and come to Christ, then surely we who call on his name will be alarmed and repent and increase our faith. And through our actions, we will grow stronger as a church. So in verse 1, Paul expresses here what I express to you and what Nathan expresses to you. 
He calls this church dear friends. He says he dearly loves them. Yet don't mistake his gentle tone as passivity. He wants this church to be stronger. And so what we see in this passage is he's addressing some weak points that exist in that Philippian church. And they're weak points that exist in almost every church. They tend to be things that mankind is weak in. So Paul's saying, I want you to be stronger in these areas. And his first exhortation is to resolve conflict. Resolve conflict. Now just imagine something this morning. Imagine if I knew that any two of you in this church this morning had an ongoing dispute with one another. And today I just stood out from the pulpit and I called you out by name. I said you and I named name one and you and I named name two and I said you two in front of the whole church. It's time for you to agree in the Lord. And then I said, now, Nathan and the rest of the church, we're all co-laborers, so let's help person one and person two get this thing right. Now, many of you would say that would be so out of line, but that's exactly what Paul did. Look at verse two. He said, I urge Euodia and Syntyche, two women, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, he's speaking to the church there. I ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul loved these women enough, and he loved this church enough to exhort them publicly so the women would be reconciled and the church would be strengthened spiritually. Now, why would he do that? Because unresolved conflict creates weakness. It creates unease and tension. And since it's easier to procrastinate rather than to solve conflict, it actually creates more conflict in the long term. People begin to hear about it, and they say, I don't want any part of that. Didn't come to church for that. Leave me out of that. But where they're, and and by the way, sometimes people have an idealistic view and say, well, those there's two people that have conflict in this church, or there's conflict in this church, and that shouldn't be this way. And I don't want anything to do with that, friends. That's not realistic. Where there are people there will be conflict. So Jesus said, here's how to resolve it. In Matthew 18, he said, if your brother sins and many manuscripts add against you, go and reprove him in private. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. In Matthew chapter 5, the situation is reversed. You know your brother has something against you, so you go and seek resolution. Most problems in churches would be quickly resolved if we obeyed Scripture. Scripturally mature people are willing to resolve conflict. And I can tell you something beyond any shadow of a doubt. Do you know what the number one source of conflict is in a church? Anybody. You want to guess? Hurt feelings. Hurt feelings. Now, to be honest, sometimes hurt feelings, they really don't need to be resolved. You just need to look in the mirror and say, get over it. You can just take your phone right now if you have one and turn it around the other way and say, get over it. 90% of the time, there was no intention on the part of the person who hurt your feelings. They just said something. Maybe they weren't thinking clearly at the time. Maybe they just said something off the cuff. You took it wrong. It doesn't matter. They didn't mean to hurt your feelings. The other 10% of the time, give people the benefit of the doubt until they prove you wrong. And if it turns out they are throwing shade at you, so what? Let it roll off your back. Other times, conflict is just a lack of communication. One person says peanuts, and you thought they said you're nuts. I mean, it's ju- and, and then other times, there is legitimate conflict, and just clarifying things sometimes can bring great healing. And where fractured relationships are restored, it can bring great strength to a church. But what do we tend to do sometimes? Instead of trying to resolve conflict, there's gossip. Now, it's one thing to go to a spiritually mature person for advice. It is another thing to spread gossip and slander. And what's worse is sometimes the offended person begins to rehearse their grievance. This is what happened, and this is what they did, and I can't believe that happened, and I'm not going to take it. And then the loop is repeated, and here's what that does. It magnifies the complaint. It exaggerates the conflict. 
it sends the offense deeper and deeper into your heart, and it makes it less likely that it'll be resolved. So look again at verse 2. Paul tells these ladies to agree in the Lord. He appeals to their position in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he urges them to reach agreement. Now, what was the issue? We don't know. It wasn't a doctrinal issue because Paul would have certainly corrected that, but otherwise, we don't have a clue. And Paul named them publicly not to shame them, but to jumpstart the process of getting this conflict resolved and, evidently, to get the church involved in the entire resolution. So let me ask each of you a question. Those of you in the back who can't see me, those of you here in the front, do you need to resolve a conflict here today? It could be you know you've wronged someone and you need to apologize, or you just need to resolve something with a brother or sister in Christ. And before you do that, ask yourself this, is it a legitimate complaint? Or to be frank, is it something you just need to get over it? Is it a genuine issue? And if it is, let's resolve it gently, humbly, calmly, and with love. And as you do that, ask yourself this. What does God want to teach me here? Not what does God want to teach this other person. What is God wanting to teach me? How can I honor him in this? How can I bring him glory? How can I humble myself in this? And then how can I demonstrate love When this is resolved. And if someone has wronged you and you toss olive branches and you try to resolve it, even if you never get a resolution, it's still an opportunity to practice gospel forgiveness and to join Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings. So, step number one to make a church stronger, resolve conflict. Step number two, this may be counterintuitive, but it's true rejoice always. Look at verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And Paul gave the same command at the start of chapter 3. He says it here twice. By the way, it's a command. It is a command. Now, rejoicing is not going to be our monolithic emotion. Rejoicing is a choice. Like forgiveness, it won't be perfect, but it can be practiced. Now, sometimes we want to look at all that is negative in the world, and we don't want to rejoice. Oh, look, and look at what's happening in the world. Do I, need to, do I need to rehearse a litany of everything that's happening? And now we've got a Supreme Court justice that needs to be nominated, and the Democrats are going to do this, and the Republicans are going to do that. You know what I think I'll do? I think I'll get mad and post something on Facebook about it. That'll help. That'll be a good witness. It'll help me rejoice. Can I just... Can I just... Maybe I talk about this every week. Can I just, some of y'all need to listen. Man, some of y'all, please, I'm begging you to hear me. Stop. Stop posting stuff on Facebook. Just stop. You think you're helping Christ's witness? You're not. It's a bad witness. It's a terrible witness. Stop posting about the second coming. Stop posting about politics. Stop posting about masks and the coronavirus. Just stop. I didn't have this in my notes. I didn't intend to say this this morning. And the more I'm saying it, the more passionate I'm getting. Just stop. How many of you feel like rejoicing now? (laughs) Just rejoice. What's your problem? Four steps. Four steps. Number one. This is the foundation of it. Rejoice over the gospel. Now, why should I rejoice over the gospel? Because you're a sinner who deserves hell. But Jesus died on the cross for you. That's called penal substitutionary atonement. Penal, the penalty that you deserved. Substitutionary. He died in your place. An atonement. He expiated or he removed your sins. And because He saved you. You're not going to hell. You're going to live forever in eternal bliss in the presence of Jesus. The happiest moment of your life on earth will look like torment compared to the unending joy of heaven. So rejoice over the gospel. Number two is singing. After observing the Last Supper, the the disciples sung Psalm 113 through 118. They did that every Passover. When Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in a Philippian jail, they sung hymns. 
Ephesians 5 says we make music in our heart to the Lord when we sing. Singing has been proven to lower stress, relieve anxiety, and elevate endorphins. I was in, uh, how many of you have heard of Rotary Clubs? Blake, I know you have. How many of you heard of Rotary Clubs? Okay. They're a great club. I was in one for 13 years. I was a president for a year. And in the club I was in, and these are the rules of Rotary International, you have to sing. Every meeting, you have to sing. Did you guys sing? Yeah, okay. Um, and we used to sing. You never heard anything like it. We sung classics like Little Liza Jane and My Darling Clementine. Dwelt a miner, 49er, oh, my darling Clementine. By the way, that's a terrible song. Do, do you know it? Poor Clementine drowns, and so her suitor decides to go chase after her sister. And the reason we were supposed to sing is it's supposed to lift your spirit. I guess you had to ignore the words, but when a believer sings biblical truth, it honors God and it elevates your spirit. So sing. And then number three is to serve. To serve. Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Well, I've served for years and it's someone else's turn. Where's that in the Bible? Serving him is a privilege. Serving lifts you up. You get involved in serving your church, no matter how simple it might be, the Holy Spirit will bring home to your heart that you are impacting other people in the But we're not being scorched by a meteor or overrun by 30-foot lizards, or in 2020, why not car-sized hailstones? Now, trials come, and they come to define us and refine us and correct us and test us, but trials are intended to humble us, and God gives grace to the humble. So when trials come, we want to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, knowing that he will exalt us at the proper time, and then you can rejoice because you know what is coming. At the end of the age, you will rejoice for having lived your life in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, resolve conflict. Number two, rejoice always. Number three, in this day and age, number three, be reasonable. Look at verse five. It says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. That word graciousness ha is a very hard word to translate. It can mean gentle spirit, consideration, moderation, reasonableness, or forbearance. Let's put it this way. It means there's a sweet reasonableness about you. That's a great phrase, sweet reasonableness. It doesn't mean you compromise truth. It doesn't mean you're a pushover. But it means you're not easily offended. It's the opposite of being contentious and self-seeking. And this forbearance characterized Jesus as he walked the face of the earth. 2 Corinthians 10 says he was meek and gentle. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When suffering, he uttered no threats. Forbearance, meekness, gentleness, this quality has alarming power. Proverbs 24 says, by forbearance, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. Entrenched people can be powerfully persuaded by this quality. In fact, that not only has alarming power, it has disarming power. Proverbs 15 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Now, sadly, and I guess I mentioned this before when I talked about social media, but some Christians seem to be a perpetually offended group. And this is so much unlike our Lord. And the motivation to help us nurture this quality is found at the end of the verse. It says the Lord is near. That refers either to his imminent coming or his omnipresence. Who would want to be overtaken by the Lord while angrily shaking their fist at something or loudly demanding what is mine is mine or expecting of others more than we expect of ourselves? So be reasonable. Resolve conflict. Rejoice always. Be reasonable. Number four, be peaceful. And here's where Paul really digs into what plagues many of us across this parking lot today. And it harms fellowship in the church, harmony in the home, and calmness in the heart. He said in verse 6, look at it, he said, don't worry about anything. Now Jesus said don't worry. 
He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the world. Don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about what you'll drink. Don't worry about what you'll wear. He said, who of you by being worried can add to a single hour of his life? And these admonitions not to worry remind us that we're really good at worrying. The Bible shows us that worry can afflict anyone. God called Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? David was the anointed king of Israel. And he said, how long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? And some of you can relate to that. The Apostle Paul said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. So notice something here in verse 6. This phrase is a command. Worry is a sin. And you say, it's a sin. I can't help it. And I can't help it is the common excuse of the flesh when confronted with sin. But why is it sin? Because in order to worry, you have to remove your faith from Christ And you have to place faith on yourself, or you have to place faith in other people, or you have to place faith in the things of this world. You see, when you worry, worry becomes the Lord of your life. You dethrone Jesus and you enthrone worry. Only Jesus is Lord. Worry is not Lord. By the way, there were many in the Bible who wanted to be Lord. One stands out above the rest. Lucifer wasn't satisfied to be being a cherubim in glory. He wanted to receive glory, and he was cast down and became Satan. And he does all that he can to make us worry. The Apostle Paul wrote this from jail. He had every reason to believe he would die, and he said, don't worry. So notice verse 6. This is a comprehensive command. Paul said, but in everything, through prayer, with petition, and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, this is very simple. If you're worried about something... Should you pray about it? Yes. What should you pray about? What does verse 6 say? Everything. Well, this thing worries me, and, but, you know, admittedly, it's probably silly, and it's probably too silly to bother God with. Not, not at all. We all have weaknesses, and that's why God says, in everything. Well, but this thing that's worrying me, it's such a little thing. Should I take it to God? All that matters is what the text says. And the text says everything. Well, this thing I'm I'm praying about, and I'm worried that it won't happen, and I'm not sure that it can ever happen. Is there anything too hard for God? So pray. We get the word prosecute from that word prayer. What does a prosecutor do? He gathers evidence. He compares the evidence against the law, and then he presents his case to the judge and the jury. So you go to God and say, here is my prayer, God, and here is the evidence. Here's why I think you should answer this. And then you appeal to the God of the universe to render a favorable verdict. But notice it not only tells us to pray, it says to make petition. A petition is simply an earnest and humble request. And when you're humbled by life's events, when something makes you worry, they make you anxious or fearful or afraid, you begin to realize how small you are compared to this entire universe and how great God is. And then you begin to confess your sins and forsake them. And it is then you pray with humility and focus. And through that process, your prayer is winnowed through the truth of God's word and As you continue to humble yourself, your prayer becomes more refined, more biblical, more God-oriented. And then you have every reason to believe you are praying in God's will. And so instructed by these verses, you know that God has heard your prayer. And then you pray with thanksgiving. You thank God for the privilege of prayer and that the shed blood of Jesus gives us access to God in prayer, and that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we pray. And so then, that leads to this consistent peace. Look at verse 7. It says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now here's the big question. What is peace? We tend to think of peace as the absence of certain things. Man, if things would just quiet down, if I could be free from all this health stuff in our family, then I'd be at peace. If all this virus stuff would just go away, 
if all this political stuff would just go away. I would be at peace if all these problems would just disappear. But the most peaceful person in the Bible is Jesus, and problems were never absent in his life. Crowds were constantly seeking him. He'd get up early and try to get away, and someone would come running after him and said that they needed him. People said that they followed him, but when his teaching didn't suit him, excuse me, suit them, they just walked out on him. They wanted nothing to do with him. And even as he preached, he knew that he was going to be crucified. He experienced grief to the point of shedding tears. And then all this talk about the government today, things didn't go his way politically, folks. He was never consulted once about who should be on the Sanhedrin. <laughs> and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans, they all hated each other. But imagine all of Congress and all of the president come together and they conspire to kill you. That's what happened to Jesus. Plus, on top of everything else, no one believed his testimony. He had no credibility in the end. He told them the truth over and over again. He gave them evidence, but in the end, they hated him. So peace cannot be defined in the terms of the absence of a problem. Problems never go away. Then what is peace? Peace is the presence of Jesus. It comes through a consistent walk with Jesus through prayer, through God's word, through obedience, and life in the church. And verse 7 says it guards our hearts and our minds. And we need that because from our hearts come emotion and feeling. From the mind comes cognition and reasoning. That means that God gives us peace in every aspect of our humanity. And then notice that little phrase at the end of verse 8. It says, in Christ Jesus. So this peace comes when your heart beats with God's heart when you completely resonate with what God values, living in Him moment by moment, living in union with Him. And I cannot help but believe I cannot help but believe that there are some people here this morning who are ready to have some peace. So there's an important truth we have to notice here. In no way is this a promise to everyone. This is a promise only for a person who is a genuine believer, who's been born from above. There's no real peace for a person who is not in Christ. Now, there is a false peace. The devil who was cast down, he gives us a false peace. The things of this world give us a false peace. But the only real peace comes from being in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm asking all of you to hear me. If you're not in Christ Jesus this morning, please know there needs to come a moment in your life when you stand before the Lord and you call upon the name of the Lord. So here's what I'm going to ask all of you to do for the next maybe two minutes. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads if you would. Now, at some point in your life, you need to go before the Lord and confess that you're a sinner. First of all, you have to come to the realization, if you're not a Christian, you have to come to this realization, I'm not a Christian. But you can become a Christian, and you simply do this. You simply go before him and say, <clears throat> Lord, I believe that Jesus died for my sin, and I, I know that your word says my sin can be forgiven by faith. So, Lord, right here and right now, I believe you. Please give me new life and bring me into your forever family. And friend, if that's the desire of your heart, then express it to the Lord Jesus Christ and he will save you. Now, for those of you who maybe aren't sure, understand that the Bible says that if you're saved, you're a new creation in Christ. If your profession is that you're saved, does your life bear witness to your faith? Not that you have a perfect life, but is your life faithful? You see, we want to know that we have eternal life on a biblical basis. So if you're not saved or you're not sure, whether you're a church member, whether it's your first time in church or anywhere in between, please understand again, Jesus died for your sins. And the Bible says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can call upon his name right now and he will save you 
And so I'm going to ask that you pray with me right now, and then Nathan and the praise team will close us. Lord, for, I pray for those that you are drawing to yourself right now that they would call upon your name and that they would be saved. And I pray for those who do know you as Lord and Savior, and I pray that you would help us grow stronger as a church. That for each one of us today, we would resolve conflict. We would rejoice always. We would be reasonable. And that we would be peaceful. And we know that peace comes from a saving relationship with you. We thank you so much for this time together in your word. I'm grateful for such a loving and attentive church. And I pray that you would take the truth of your word and that you would bring glory and honor to your glorious son's name. And I pray it. I pray it all in the mighty and the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now we move into a time of offering as the praise team prepares to close us. And each week I try to tell you just a little bit about what we're doing to advance the kingdom. The church replant in Linwood that we've talked about launches October 11th. And I know Dave and Lee Kaufman and Chris and Liz Small have been attending there on Wednesdays. And we're excited to help that get off the ground. We're going to be talking to you very soon about helping them financially for a time. We substantially funded a part of the uh, Tonganachi Elementary School's Backpack Buddies program. That's for kids who don't have enough to eat on the weekends, which is so tragic. And I'm proud of you for being so generous to do that. You do more than you realize when you give, and every believer is called to give. Tithing is a good standard of giving. That's 10% of your income, and I can testify to the glory of the Lord that Tara and I have tithed from day one of our marriage done it when we had a little we've done it when we had plenty if you don't give if giving seems daunting to you understand that God blesses givers he blesses those who are generous and I believe that he does not work in you spiritually that he won't do otherwise there are things that you learn when you give and so I want to encourage all of you to step out on faith especially in these days and give generously to be a part of God's work in that way and we have a number of ways you can give there's a basket over here you can you can give there. Please don't give any cash there. Inside, by the sound booth, there's a slot in the wall. You can put an offering in there. Most people are these days are going to our website and giving. There's a little button in the upper right-hand corner. You can give via debit and credit card. So we just encourage you to give. I thank you so much for being here today. I love you folks. Nathan and the praise team are going to close us. Would you stand with us as we sing and, and conclude? Still amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how He could pardon me, a sinner.
still sing that throughout the ages. Just real quick instructions, uh, they'll be ready downstairs, so you can head downstairs anytime you like. You can eat down there, you can eat anywhere in the church, you can bring it back out here. Thank you so much for being with us. We really encourage you to stay and enjoy the fellowship. God bless you. Have a great day.